Hey, Nicole, what are you doing? Oh, you know, just learning about Great Lakes coastal marshes. It's part of my master's thesis research, so it's probably a good thing that I learned some stuff about them. Whoa! Did you know that Great Lakes coastal marshes are found along the shores and associated areas of the Great Lakes in the entire region? Oh no! They've actually been experiencing a lot of loss since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Like 50% of Great Lakes coastal wetlands in Michigan have been lost in the last hundred years. This is the CMU Herbarium. What a great resource. Hey Clint, what are you working on? Oh, I'm trying to learn more about Great Lakes coastal marshes in Michigan. Well, the herbarium is a great place to start. Hey Hillary, do you know any indicator species for Great Lakes coastal marshes? Yes, actually, Xenoplectus pungens. Oh, awesome, cool. Look at all these online resources that you're utilizing. To learn about indicator species in Great Lakes coastal marshes, the herbarium is a good place to start. People have collected different species of plants from Great Lakes coastal marshes and preserved them as herbarium specimens. There's Typha latifolia, Typha angustifolia, Iliacaris palustris, Xenoplectus acutus, and Xenoplectus pungens. Herbarium labels are especially helpful because they can tell you when you can expect to find the plant, when you can expect the plant to flower, and how long historically the plant has been present in that wetland for. For example, Using these two different herbarium specimens of Xenoplectus acutus, we can tell that this species has been in Michigan from 1964 to at least 2011. Herbarium labels are also useful for historic specimens. This Xenoplectus pungens was collected in 1965. The herbarium label tells us that it's very historically abundant in the Great Lakes coastal marshes. The CMU herbarium is a great resource, but let's see what we can find in the field and other resources. Hello! Welcome to Central Michigan University's Wetland Ecology Lab. Here in the Wetland Ecology Lab, we have a few different research questions that we focus on. These research questions are important to Great Lakes coastal marshes. The first question is, how do Great Lakes coastal marshes compare to inland wetlands? The second question that we have is, how does global climate change affect Great Lakes coastal marshes? So to frame my digital journal in a research question, I'm going to base this on the fact that we have gone to several different types of inland wetlands throughout the semester, and we've visited one Great Lakes coastal marsh. However, I'm going to take you on a tour of a different coastal marsh so we can see the variability between Great Lakes coastal marshes and other inland wetland systems and communities. We're all ready to go. We have to make sure we have our identification materials, safety materials, and maps and driving directions. Remember, it is hunting season and duck hunting is popular in the Saginaw Bay region. Nobody will shoot me now. My name is Nicole, and I think that wetlands are pretty neat, which is why I created Nature Walk Wetland Edition, so I can show everyone how neat nature is, instead of just me knowing it. How neat is that?
Well, this view over here is a Great Lakes coastal marsh. You can tell it's a Great Lakes marsh because of the way it is. Wait, Nicole, I don't understand. Can you elaborate for me? Good question. Let me tell you everything I know about this wetland plant community. We're going to start talking about the hydrology of Great Lakes coastal marshes. An important thing about Great Lakes coastal marshes, possibly the most important thing, is that they're influenced by the Great Lakes. At this wetland here, in Saginaw Bay, the wetland is directly influenced by Lake Huron and the bay, as you can see behind me. Like most wetlands, hydrology is greatly variable in Great Lakes coastal marshes. One thing that makes it so variable is seiche events. Seiche events are highly variable water fluctuations created by wind pushing water back and forth at a lake-wide scale, similar to water in a bathtub sloshing back and forth. These changes can be from several feet in just a few hours to just a few inches over the course of a day. Um, there's evidence of a sage right here because you can tell that just possibly yesterday this was totally inundated and covered in water, but now it's just slightly damp. Since Great Lakes coastal marshes are fed by the Great Lakes, their hydrology usually stays relatively constant in that it's mostly inundated for most of the season. Or at least there's some ice cover. As you can see, it's almost November and it, there's still standing water. How neat is that? Great Lakes coastal marshes that are highly variable. Soils in Great Lakes coastal marshes are highly variable. One thing that determines the soils is the geologic content. In Saginaw Bay, the geologic content is soft sedimentary bedrock, whereas in no more northern wetlands, it would be limestone. Gotta stir up the earth a little bit. This soil here is a little bit, it's a mixture of sandy muck. As you can see, this section of the Great Lakes Marsh is pretty open and unprotected from the bay. That's why this soil seems a little bit sandier than a soil that we might find over there in the more protected region. And in the more protected area of the wetland, more, it's more um, protected from wave action. So more organic matter and fallen plants are able to accumulate. This creates a very deep, organic substrate that you can sink into really far. Now that we know about the hydrology and soils of Great Lakes coastal marshes, let's check out some vegetation. One unique thing about Great Lakes coastal wetlands and marshes is that they're usually organized into vegetation zones based on depth. These vegetation zones can include wet meadow, emergent, floating leaves, and submergent vegetation. And there's usually a dominant genus um, present in each zone. So in this wetland, we probably, before they sprayed for Phragmites, had a Phragmites zone, a Typha zone there, and probably some floating leaf and submerged aquatic vegetation filling in along the middle. That's pretty neat! <laughs> Uncommon plant found in Great Lakes coastal marshes is the genus Typha. Typha can have a few different species such as Latifolia, Angustifolia, or very commonly hybrids. Typha was invasive and still is, but it's not as big as an, of an issue as other invasives such as Phragmites or Myriophyllum. Typha requires a lot of nutrients and low wave action to grow, so it can tell you a lot about the conditions of this wetland. Typha also happens to be an indicator species for Great Lakes coastal marshes. So here it is, it's a Great Lakes coastal marsh. How neat is that? How neat is this? Sheenoplectus pungens.
This is an indicator species for a Great Lakes coastal marsh. It's three square bulrush. All of the Xenoplectus pungens indicates that this is a Great Lakes coastal marsh because Xenoplectus pungens is an indicator species. Hey Nicole, what's another indicator species for Great Lakes coastal marshes? That's a great question, Sasha. Iliacaris is another indicator species for Great Lakes coastal marshes, in addition to Xenoplectus pungens and Xenoplectus acutus and typha, but I haven't seen any here. Xenoplectus pungens is pretty cool, but let's see if we can find another species. How neat would that be? Ah, there it is! How neat is that? Xenoplectus Cabernet Montani. This is soft stem bulrush. What a beaut! Check out this neat floating aquatic vegetation. It's duckweed, or the genus Lemna. How neat is that? Potamagee and Richard Sonai. Look at this obvious plant, Biden Cernua. How could anyone get this wrong on the practical? Although it's not alive anymore, this is an indicator that Sagittaria was here. Another noteworthy species here is Potopagetan pectinitis. The invasive genotype of Phragmites australis is a big problem around Great Lakes coastal wetlands. Like most coastal wetlands in the Great Lakes, Phragmites has invaded this area. Fortunately, it looks like some management has sprayed for it. That's why it's all dead. How unneat is that? It's Myriophyllum, otherwise known as the invasive Eurasian milfoil. Phragmites and Eurasian milfoil are two types of invasive species that we've already talked about. A third, which isn't actually present right now, but we know that there is a nest of it, is mute swans. Mute swans are very detrimental to the submerged aquatic vegetation of Great Lakes coastal wetlands because they can consume a lot of it in just one day. So there used to be a nest over here and we have a picture of it that we'll show you. groups, this wetland in particular has been controlled for it. So you can see behind me, this whole area used to be Phragmites, but they either burned it or applied some other sort of management technique to get rid of it. Before they did that, however, this whole area was probably monodonimate with Phragmites, which is a bad thing that happens to Great Lakes coastal wetlands when Phragmites invades. <laughs> coastal marsh is such a beaut, but you can tell that it's got a lot of impact from anthropogen anthropogenic disturbances. There's a playground right here where people obviously come and play. There's a parking lot over here. This wetland is probably pretty disturbed by humans. This is a pretty high traffic area. There's a parking lot just up, just around the back over here. And you can see the evidence of it in this puddle. There's gasoline or some sort of oil. Not cool. Another type of anthropogenic disturbance in this wetland is this boat dock. Not only can cars come up and launch their boats right into the wetland, but there's also dredging that
that occurred right through and in, out into the bay. Dredging can affect Great Lakes coastal wetlands by um, stirring up the sediments and creating a lot of turbidity. Also, it takes away some of the submerged aquatic vegetation that is very important to the system. Hunting is another type of disturbance that occurs at this wetland. I bet that these expert duck hunters really pack the heat. 